Welcome to the Reading for the Glory podcast. I'm your host, Zach Kendrick, editor of Reading for the Glory. Reading for the Glory exists to help followers of Jesus think biblically about books. For more information, please visit readingfortheglory.com. This episode is brought to you in part by Airbender LLC. For our listeners in the Birmingham, Alabama metro area, Airbender is the HVAC company to call for quality and reliable residential heating and cooling services. Airbender is a BBB accredited company that offers the complete suite of HVAC repair and installation services. To request your free estimate, call 205-603-9306 or click the link in today's show notes. Airbender LLC, keeping you comfortable in all seasons. Today is a big day here at Reading for the Glory. Uh, This is the very first episode of our inaugural season of the Reading for the Glory podcast, and I am excited and honored to be joined by our podcast editor, Chris Wheeler. Chris serves as the Minister of Worship and Youth at East 40 Church in Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, Chris is a high-energy guy who seeks to equip the next generation with biblical truth that is enveloped in the grace of Christ. Chris enjoys listening to and playing music. He loves to watch the latest Marvel and or Star Wars movie. He also loves listening to, and we add here, now creating and editing podcasts, not just listening to them. Uh, Chris and his wife, Melanie, have one child, Chloe, and two dogs, Sela and Otis. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, and glad to have you. Uh, so just one quick observation. Um, I don't think it's an accident that a worship pastor has a dog named Sela. Is that... 100% on purpose. Uh, we rescued her from a really abusive farm. Mm. Um, she was a, a full working sheep dog. Wow. And when she we took her in, um, we decided, you know, you're retired. It's time to rest. That, Your name is Sela. That is, I was about to ask that. That is awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, uh, so before we get into our formal discussion, because the purpose of this podcast today, the very first one that we are uh, launching is to discuss the life and ministry and influence of the late Timothy Keller. Uh, I wanted our audience to to get to know Chris a little bit better. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a few questions, kind of a lightning round, I'm going to call it. And I think we're going to plan to do this with all our guests just to kind of do a little icebreaker and get to know our guests uh, when they're on for the first time. So I'm just going to ask you a couple questions and you just give me one or two word answers and then we'll move on to the rest of our conversations. Does that sound good? Should I be nervous? No. Okay, good. Where did you grow up, Chris? I grew up in the outskirts of Seattle, Washington, in a place called Everett. I mean, if you're from there, it's not the outskirts, the closest place to it. Um, and then I moved in when I was in high school to the mountains on Highway 2 in Washington. Um, so grew up in middle of nowhere. So Pacific uh, Northwesterner. Yes, sir. By, by trade or by, by birth, now that you live in the heartland of America, you... <laughs> yes. Is it still cold up there? Uh, you didn't want to come any further south? Uh, yeah, to- yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. Actually, Seattle is pretty temperate hmm. com- by comparison to the rest of the U.S. Like, it doesn't gotcha. get drastically cold, doesn't get drastically hot. It just rains all the time. Yeah, yeah. So at least you get sunshine in, in Ohio, even if it's colder. I get tons of sunshine. It's great. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite color? Favorite color would have to be maroon. That's a very specific, instead, you know, not just red, it's maroon. It's very fortunate because the closest high school, their colors are maroon. So oh. it, it, it works out that, you know, go John Glenn, um, that I just happen to have that their colors as my favorite color. And I just made the connection. Is Zanesville, Ohio, where the astronaut John Glenn is from? Yes, sir. There you go. Well, that's cool. So you're, you're the youth that you teach are not only reaching for heaven, they're reaching, they might be astronauts in real life. Reaching for the stars. So what's your favorite food? Uh, Oh, I'm going to go high class and low class. Okay. Sushi is my absolute favorite, but then I'm a youth pastor, so anytime there's pizza, I'm diving in. There you go. So are you pizza like Little Caesars cheap pizza, Totino's cheap pizza, or like just a run-of-the-mill Domino's 
depends on the budget that I have. Um, gotcha. <laughs> if, 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 I, if I'm buying it for myself, I'm going with, there's a place called Picnic Pizza here in Zanesville that is fantastic, authentic Italian. Uh, the wow. guy's from Italy. Wow. Um, but if I'm buying for the youth group, it's absolutely the cheapest we can get. Little Caesars. Yeah, that was me yeah. in, in youth ministry. <laughs> I lived on Little and got sick of Little Caesars pizza. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I was in youth ministry. Uh, but all right, so what's, I'm, I'm getting hungry. Let's stop talking about food. Um, what's your favorite sport to watch? I would have to say baseball. I'm not a big sports guy, but I am 100% a Mariners fan, Seattle Mariners through ah. and through. I keep track with their seasons fairly regularly. Well, well, growing up, it was back when Ken Griffey Jr. was out there probably. Oh, 100%. So you were, yeah. Ken Griffey Jr., A-Rod, all those, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Uh, this is probably a dumb question, knowing that you're a, a, a music pastor, but what is your favorite hobby? Uh, yeah, uh, backpacking. Really? Yeah, our big backpackers, my wife and I, our honeymoon, we spent backpacking in the Rocky Mountains. Um, every vacation we would go on was backpacking until we had a kid. And then you carry her backpack. Yes. Yeah. Which is probably just as heavy as going backpacking. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so besides the Bible, so we're going to just... We're going to assume that's your favorite book. Besides the Bible, what's your favorite book? Oh, I would have to say The Stand by Stephen King. Wow. I think I could, could see you being a Stephen King fan. 100%. Yeah. So you're more of a fiction guy than a nonfiction guy as far as books are concerned. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which makes sense with the, the Star Wars and Marvel. and. Yeah, I like to disassociate from the reality. I gotcha. <laughs> Now we're going to transition to our, our formal conversation about the life and ministry of Timothy Keller, the late Timothy Keller. Um, he was one of the most influential pastors, theologians, and, and even apologists, Christian apologists of our time, uh, and probably, I would even say, of church history. W would you would you say that too? 100%, yes, sir. I mean, obviously, there's Martin Luther's and John Calvin's and Augustine's and Thomas Aquinas's and obviously the Apostles. Jesus as well. Obviously, he's the <laughs> pinnacle there. But, but of all the the you know non deity <laughs> uh, followers um, in church history, I mean, I wouldn't put him in the top ten necessarily, but I would. He would definitely be in the top one hundred or one hundred and fifty of church history, um, which is pretty pretty rare error probably. Um, his books and sermons and other writings, you know, they've been really uh, influential and have been seen and heard by millions worldwide. I know he's been translated into, I don't know how many languages. Um, he's probably most known for his work as the founding pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, as well as being the co-founder of the Gospel Coalition. Um, and then sadly, Tim Keller passed away back in May of 2023 after a battle with, with cancer. And I know he is, he is missed not only by his family and his church family, but by many around the world who were very influenced by his, his ministry. In 2023, uh, Colin Hansen of the Gospel Coalition, he published the first of what I would expect to be several biographies that would, in the coming years, uh, of Tim Keller, about Tim Keller. And the title of, of Hansen's book is Timothy Keller, His Spiritual and Intellectual Formation. And that is the subject of our conversation today. And then we're going to couple that with an extended conversation about his life and ministry and influence on our own lives. But uh, first, we're going to talk about the book. Um, so, Chris, what were your first impressions of Colin's biography of Tim Keller? Well, it was a really well thought out book. I've, I've read quite a few biographies in my time, and this one was unique to me. Um, it wasn't just a chronological covering of his life. Uh, it was all it, it talked more about his influences than it did himself. Uh, so that that was really cool to see, like you know, my like spiritual mentors, spiritual mentors. It, it was really cool for me to read. Yeah, I would I would say the same. Um, 
it was very well put together. It's not as thick as I thought it would be. That was that was one thing I was a little bit surprised about. Um, but there is a lot packed in this short book. I mean, it's not super short, but it's. I mean, most biographies um, are maybe twice this size. I mean, this is only sitting at about three hundred pages with the notes, but probably actual, you know, book space is about 250 pages, which is kind of short for a biography, but, but he, I mean, but, Bonhoeffer's is double that. <laughs> right. Colin Hansen packs a lot into this biography, even though it's somewhat on the short end. Um, but since it is more about his influences, um, spiritual and intellectual, I guess that's why it's a little shorter than, than we might expect, even though he does go into his, um, you know, biography of like his early years. What did you find most interesting about the book? Um, honestly, the like I just said, it, I found it strangely interesting how it wasn't just the chronological covering of his life. I, I'd never read a book that went into depth about the subject's influences. So that, that was really, it, it was a little weird for me to adjust to it first. I mean, because yeah, it did go chronological but then also went into that. Um, mm. And that was like, honestly, the most interesting thing. I heard a lot of names I had never heard before. Um, because of that, I'm actually looking into Gordon Conwell and Westminster as places to get my master's. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Like yeah. I just love all of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he was very, very interesting um, gentleman, even, you know, as very, very, very highly intellectual individual. Um, and so, you know, you see that starting at a young age and, and even up through his formative years and into his seminary years and, and his years as a pastor. And I found it interesting that he would, I believe it was in his college years, not at seminary, but it, uh, he would uh, stand on the quad or the public space out in, in the, on campus and, and try to give out C.S. Lewis books <laughs> to people <laughs> to try to convince them of, of Christianity. <clears throat> and so I found that kind of interesting that he was, you see him as, and we'll talk about this later, but you see him as that winsome evangelist and apologist that wasn't just something he learned in New York City. He was doing that even in college, handing yeah. out C.S. Lewis books. So um, I found I found that interesting. What did you find most helpful about the book? Uh, so it was helpful for me um, on how the book portrayed how human Tim was, how fallible Tim was. I mean, it might sound weird, uh, but when you read a lot from one person and you look to look up to them a ton, they can almost become like an idol to you. Um, and this book brought me back down to earth. Uh, yeah. He struggled with things and was bad at things just like I am. Um, you know, he wasn't a great preacher starting out. It mm -hmm. says here that he got a C in his preaching class at Westminster Seminary. Wow. He wasn't initially yeah. good at preaching and ministering to an urban culture in New York. It, it took time. Um, right. So it gives hope for, you know, dummies like me who were just starting out. Well, you're not just a dummy starting out, um, but... Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I uh, probably only Jesus would would I don't know. Some people might flunk Jesus on preaching. Who knows? But uh, I think only Jesus can start out well. You know, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Absolutely, it's hard to beat that. It's like somebody starting with their most famous song, um, and then what do you? It's all downhill from there. But but with Jesus, everything's uphill. So, um, but yeah, I, I found most helpful. Just thinking about his early ministry in uh, Hopewell, Virginia, mm -hmm. um, and how even though he it was a very different uh, culture than what he was used to growing up, but also a very different culture from what he is known for in ministry, which was his his work in uh, New York City. But he still, because he's known for contextualization and meeting people where they are. And, and he definitely did that in Hopewell. And 
Uh, he wasn't, again, perfect at it, and he was kind of bumping his head as he went along. Um, but he he learned ministry there in Virginia, and he still had things he applied in his ministry in New York City that he was honing um, in, in Hopewell. So I found that most helpful for me because we all have room to grow. And um, so... That was yeah. incorrect. I don't know how he did it all there. Like he was preaching multiple times a week. He was right. a youth minister. He was picking songs. He was counseling like 10 people a week. Like the dude had no time to sleep. Yeah. I mean, so if you're just a music uh, pastor and the, and the youth guy, you must have all kinds of time in the world, right? Oh, I, I only work like two hours a week. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. Dear boss, if you are listening to this, that is a joke. <laughs> um, but no, I, I found that interesting too, just how there's some people that are just wired for that workload and, um, and it doesn't even seem that he burnt out really, um, uh, because he's not like you think of some, and I won't name any names here, but we know of, of pastors who, who had really, you know, big influence and they were going, you know, full steam ahead, blowing and going, wide mm-hmm. open ministry had, you know, speaking engagements and books and and they burn out in ministry. And something comes out about their conduct or how they're behaving themselves a- as a leader and then it just fizzles out. That doesn't seem to be the case for Tim Keller. Um and <clears throat> you know, I think I've heard it said, you know, um be careful who you look up to because um, and you know, be careful who your heroes are because oh, yeah. you, uh, especially um, living heroes, because you don't know how their story is going to end. Tim Keller was definitely not perfect, and he he was very unique in his intellect and in his gifting. And I mean, you can't really emulate Tim Keller. Um, uh, also, I try to every time I preach. <laughs> I don't, (laughs) but, uh, I mean, his son, Michael, uh, I was watching a a video from him and he, he looks like him and sounds like him. I mean, not exactly, but I guess he's the closest you could get to, uh, emulating, but, um, but he, his story ends well, Mm -hmm. um, all the way to the end. Um, he doesn't fall away. He doesn't burn out. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but he was still bringing glory to God, even in his suffering. And um, so, yeah, I think that's another thing that's so helpful about his his story is um, what it's like to follow Jesus to the end. And he is an example to us all of finishing well. So did you learn anything new about Tim Keller uh, that you didn't know before you read the book? A lot. A ton. Uh, I didn't know much about his early life growing up, about his mom being so strict and all that kind of stuff. Um, The the funnest fact that I learned um, about him, I I knew he was a Lord of the Rings fan. I knew he was a Tolkien fan. He brings him up constantly in his sermons. I didn't know the extent to which he was a fan. Um, In the book, it mentions that he reads the trilogy something like every year and he has done that for 30 years or so like that's dedication that's i know that's probably not what you're really asking for but like that that really stuck out to me how dedicated of a fan he was to tolkien yeah yeah well and and tolkien is um one of those kind of like lewis who it's not explicitly christian material in the sense it's not a christian living book or uh, not well done Christian fiction, quote unquote, uh, book. Um, but it's just a good work of art. It is a good work of fiction. And, um, you know, people around the world read the Lord of the Rings and don't see God in it at all. They don't see Christ in it at all, but you can read it. And if you're looking for it, you find him. Um, and uh, so Keller probably, that's probably, I know that's where he got a lot of his imagery for his preaching. Oh, and yeah. also with Lewis too, he quotes C.S. Lewis 
all the time. I mean, his wife was a pen pal with C.S. Lewis before she realized right. he was famous. Right. Which, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> yes. So and this sweet little girl just writing to this author that she thinks no one knows about. Right. Trying to cheer him up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I found that interesting as well. Um, he, he, he was very dedicated to... Uh, his his love of books and his love of story and I mean that that just came out in his preaching um, and so if would you recommend this book to others um, is this something you would hand out to people or if somebody's looking for a good biography would you say you got to read this book well one hundred percent if you are a fan of biographies or Tim Keller or just church leaders. Yeah. Um, any yeah. of the three, you know, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably not a book for everybody out there, but, um, but maybe, uh, but yeah, you know, I would recommend it, uh, too, um, just to anybody who, you know, is a follower of Christ, even if you're not in Christian ministry, um, you know, so many things that you can learn from the, his life, about following Christ, about evangelism, about apologetics, about being a lifelong learner. Um, all those things come out in the book. So um, do you think this is a book that you would reread again? Uh, yeah, I, I, I read it for the first time when it came out, and then I read it again in preparation for this podcast. So yes, I would read it again. You've already read it again. There you yeah, go. I've already read yeah. it again, and I yeah. probably will read it again, again, down the road when I'm just, you know, when I miss, it feels like I'm missing my friend. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think so too. And especially since it being, you know, somewhat short, uh, it's pretty, doesn't take too long to get through and, and pretty easy to, to read. And, um, but again, packed with information, we'll be sure to put a link, uh, to the book, uh, in show notes so that people can know where to get the book. And uh, yeah, we hope our listeners will check out Timothy Keller, His Spiritual and Intellectual Formation by Colin Hansen. Are you a pastor, a Bible teacher, or simply an everyday follower of Jesus looking to go deeper in your study of God's Word? Then check out Logos Bible Software. This unique software allows you to browse a vast amount of biblical content at your fingertips. An amazing feature of the new Logos 10 is the ability to scan print books from your theological library directly into your Logos account. This allows you to search your entire library in seconds for that perfect quote or bit of information that you've been looking for. Enjoy 10% off your Logos purchase for being a listener of the Reading for the Glory podcast. Browse the available Logos packages today at the link in show notes. But let's shift our conversation a little bit now to not just the book, but to Tim Keller's legacy, his influence in our lives, and and how um, he has seen even beyond his his passing. When did you first hear about Tim Keller in, in your own life? Uh, it was in two thousand nine, shortly after the book Prodigal God came out, um, which is the first book that I read by him. Um, because I was coming out of a prodigal season in my life. Mm. Um, I was just joined the military and I fell off the bandwagon hard. Um, I don't need to get into my full testimony, but I was that younger son. I was the prodigal son. Um, and so when this book came out, it was a revelation uh, that Jesus is the better elder brother who is actually coming out to search for me and not being that, Oh, why didn't, why did he get all this? Um, yeah. So that, that 100% that's. Yeah. For me, I, I, I was trying to think about that when I first, I don't think there was a, a moment that I remember when I very first heard of Tim Keller at, it's like one of those things, like it was probably about 10 or 15 years ago um, in 2010 ish, which was, around the same time you did. And uh, I was in, you know, early in my own ministry and I was in seminary. And uh, so pro probably, probably around there is, is when, um, when I heard about Tim Keller. Um, I was thinking about the first book I read about or by him, uh, I guess 
Colin Hansen's book is the first book I've read about him. Uh, but <laughs> the first book uh, uh, by Tim Keller, um, I think the I, I, I was trying to decide which one, I couldn't remember. Um, I know that the first one I ever heard about was the reason for God. Yeah, um, his probably that's probably most people's introduction to his right. Work. Absolutely, um, it's his you know encore song. You know, <laughs> it's his yeah. His his most fa- yes, his most famous piece of art. Um, but I think that the first book I read by him was his book, Every Good Endeavor, which is about um, doing your work as unto the Lord. And even if it's not explicitly in ministry, pastoral ministry, it's in the workplace, uh, in the school, uh, in, in you know, if you're in college or whatever, whatever you're doing, do as unto the Lord. Every good endeavor, it can be a ministry, it can be a calling, um, and you can the Lord will use you in that to serve Him for the kingdom. And I think I was going through a season where I was coming out of pastoral ministry, and that was a book I needed at that time. And I think that may be the very first one that I read by Him. Um. So, and and you were talking about the prodigal God as probably being your favorite book. One hundred percent. Yeah, my favorite book by him would probably be the Prodigal Prophet. Oh, okay. The, the book about Jonah, mm-hmm. not necessarily because I was. You know, are you a Jonah? From, no, I'm not. I, I, <laughs> we all are Jonas in a lot of. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, I, that's one of the books that I have reread. Uh, over over time, um, and um, and also the every good endeavor uh, would probably be one of those of my favorites too, just because um, that aspect of calling and you don't have to be a pastor, or a missionary, or church leader to serve in ministry. Uh, that's the yeah. what that book's about, and it's really encouraging to me. So, um, I would probably say the Prodigal Prophet and Every Good Endeavor. Um, would be my my favorite Keller books. Which of Keller's books have you most often referenced? I would have to say his book Forgive, which is one of his newest. Yeah, um, I, I teach on forgiveness a ton with my youth group, um, and that book has so much in it that speaks on that. Obviously, its namesake, but I'm I'm big on forgiveness and how. I, I love how that book talks about when you don't forgive, it's more of a detriment to you and a sickness to you and a poison to you than to the other person. Mm. Um, so 100%, I have read that book the most. I've referenced that book the most than probably anything outside of the Bible. Wow. it's pretty good. Shameless plug there, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think for me, um, <clears throat> I would probably, the, the book that I've probably most referenced by him would be The Reason for God. Um, I've only read it once all the way through. It's a hard read sometimes. It, it is. Um, and s- some of it, you know, like Making Sense of God, which is kind of like the se- the sequel to that book, is also hard to get through. I read it through once um, as well, um, but it, it's one of those that you, you read it through and then you can reference it. Um, getting, you know, in preparation for teaching about apologetics, you know, something like that, I, I've used the, the reason for God. His arguments for um, natural law and, and, and understanding the difference between right and wrong and how all cultures have that. Where does that come from? Mm-hmm. You know, it comes from, from God. And, um, it, that's an argument for the existence of God. Um, and so he, he articulates that well in the reason for God. And I've referenced that chapter specifically over and over. So, uh, yeah, the reason for God would, would probably be my most referenced, Probably a book that I I reread every year is Hidden Christmas. Um, you know, it it goes through the kind of gives a profile of you know Joseph and Mary and the wise men and uh, the shepherds and 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 it goes through uh, how our culture 
you know, Christmas is is like the one holiday, maybe Easter too, but but more specifically, more popularly, Christmas is that that time of the year that everybody's talking about Christmas. And yes, nowadays it's it's mostly about Santa Claus and Christmas lights and cookies and Hallmark movies and all that. But the the true uh, reason for the season, not to be cliche, but the, the true reason we celebrate Christmas is still underlying a lot of that. And it gives you an opportunity to have conversations with people about the gospel and about Jesus. And that book kind of helps me think through that every year. So um, Hidden Christmas is is one of those books for me. Which um, book of, of Tim Keller's would you most recommend to somebody? Oh, that's a good one. I would say another recent one from him. It's called Hope in Times of Fear. So it's one that he wrote as he got the cancer diagnosis. Yes. Um, and, and then, th- you know, COVID was Co- COVID, COVID yes. coming on and all of that. Right. And yeah. it was just him unpacking his own fear right. in the world um, and just saying, hey, yeah, it's scary. But we have a good God that we can trust. Yes. Um, and that one brought me so much peace that I think anyone, no matter left, right, up, down, um, can glean something from that book to be hopeful about. Yeah. Yeah. That's a book we actually have um, an article about on readingfortheglory.com. Uh, so listeners can go on the website and and search for that and uh, – yeah, I would probably uh, recommend The Reason for God. Uh, I know that's a book here recently that I've actually given away to someone who is uh, agnostic um, in his um, faith. And we've had conversations about the gospel and about the existence of God. And uh, I gave him that book as some more further reading. And um, so... So yeah, the reason for God, uh, or if it's somebody who is already a believer, I would probably give them every good endeavor, um, especially if they're um, not in ministry, because I think a lot of people who aren't in ministry kind of struggle with how they can leverage their career for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of the gospel. And that book really goes into that. And um, so... I would I would probably recommend that one. So you were saying before we started officially recording the episode that you had at one point for a couple of years there listened to every or not every but a sermon a day by Tim Keller. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is amazing. So you kind of instead of reading the Lord of the Rings once a year, you were listening to Tim Keller every year. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would. You know, I, I have a few pot, like I have a, a, I'm a, I'm a person of routine. And so, you know, like when I'm taking a shower, I'm listening to a certain podcast. It's, you know, about 10 minutes long. And, you know, when I'm getting ready for the day and then on my way to work, I had about a 35 minute commute and I would just put on the Tim Keller latest sermon from his ministry. And I, I did that for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so I, I've, I've heard him more than I've read him. Yes. So since you've listened to him. A lot. I've probably read him more than I've listened to him. Um, but what would be your favorite quote? I'd, so I, I couldn't, I can't narrow it down. I have two that I really cling to. Um, so one, when he's talking about people that are skeptical about God and Jesus, so his quote, describe the God that you've rejected. Describe the God you don't believe in. Maybe I don't believe in that God either. There, there's a lot of misconceptions yeah. that people have about God and about Jesus that are frankly untrue. Yeah. Um, you know, his book, The Reason for God, it talks about the truth of God. And I, and he also believed that a lot of people are skeptical, not because of the truth of, truth of God, but because of the goodness of God. They don't believe that the goodness is there. And if you really dive in, if you really look at it, it's not true at all. Mm. So I I love that quote. Mm. The second one would be 
The gospel says that you are simultaneously more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, yet more loved and accepted than you ever dared hope. You stole mine. Ha! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yeah, that was mine, man. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, we, like, uh, I, we think too highly of ourselves and not enough of, of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I love the second part of that because I, I reckon, I mean, not to the full extent, obviously, but I recognize how flawed and sinful I am. Um, if you know me, you know, I have a pretty tumultuous past, um, hmm. some drug abuse, some alcohol abuse, some other types of abuse in my past. Um, so I know how sinful I am. It took a long time for me to come to terms with how loved and accepted I am. Hmm. Um, even after I believed, long after I believed, I had a hard time wrapping my head around that. I think the flip side of that sometimes is um, I think there are a lot of believers who who probably definitely struggle with with the gospel in that in the way that, that you just described. But I think uh, the danger of somebody who grew up in the faith, grew up in the church, is um, the the fact that um, you know we're we're more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. Yeah. Um, and I think the flip side of that, though, is maybe not believing that they're loved and accepted. They almost, you know, maybe it's a temptation, and I would even maybe say myself included in that sometimes, is we we don't see ourselves as sinful and flawed as, as we dare believe, but we assume that we're loved and accepted by Jesus and almost take it for granted yeah, and almost use it as a license to be more sinful than we didn't Paul say something believe. about that? <laughs> I believe he did. <laughs> I believe he did. Um, I mean, that, that harkens back to my favorite book, prodigal God. Yes. You yeah, know, yeah. one, you know, is, is talking fully about the younger brother and the one other is fully talking about the elder brother. Absolutely. Yeah. So since you stole my quote, um, I've been sitting here thinking about another one, I'm not doing a quick Google search. I actually just saw this. I think it was on Instagram a couple of days ago, and I don't know where it was. It was just him standing, uh, talking at a conference or a church. It didn't look like Redeemer Church from what I could tell. It was at a conference or something, but um, he was talking about um, the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Uh, who was the first uh, person in space. And he was talking about um, how, you know, Soviet society was built, you know, communism was built on mm -hmm. you know, atheism and, and trying to prove that God doesn't exist. And that, that Gregory, when he got up into space and, and came back down, he said, I've been up into space. I didn't see God. He doesn't exist. And this is not really a direct quote. I'm just kind of paraphrasing what, what Keller said, but he, he goes on to say something to the effect of um, kind of quoting C.S. Lewis. There he comes in again, <laughs> um, who, who kind of wrote a, I believe, I don't know if it was at the BBC or I don't know where he published this, but he kind of, uh, Lewis published a, a kind of a response to Gregarian's hey, I went to space and didn't see God. And he said, man going into space, so I'm going to butcher this, but it was something to the effect of man going into space and not seeing God is like Hamlet saying, I don't see Shakespeare. That, That's good. That Hamlet doesn't know that Shakespeare exists unless Shakespeare writes himself into the story and reveals himself. Yeah, yeah. And so that is exactly what the incarnation is. And that's, that's what Keller goes on to talk about in that clip is that's what Jesus has done in the incarnation. He has revealed himself. He has revealed God to us by writing himself into the story and allowing us to see who he is so that we can be back in right fellowship with him. So um, not really a direct quote, but... It's a good one too, though. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was a good one I saw the other day. This may be hard. This next question may be hard to put, you know, to quantify at least this, this close to his own passing and, you know, being heavily influenced by him. I think maybe historians and other theologians and writers will have to fully tease out uh, this question. But, but just for the sake of our conversation here, what do you think the impact um, that Keller's legacy will have in years to come? Uh, I would 100% be, say, the way he conducted himself with people he disagreed with. Hmm. That is so uncommon in today's culture. Yeah. You know, because of Tim Keller's impact and the way he carried himself, like I now can have deep relationships and friendships with people on the other side of Christianity. Like we can have deep theological convictions that are different, but still have a grounded peaceable conversation about the gospel and that's largely because of the way tim keller handled himself so i think yes. that our christian society as a whole could benefit from that greatly in today um you know there's so many twitter theologians out there that just are on edge and yell at people when there's a slight disagreement um there, there's there, there's no sense of humility there um, that is absolutely correct. We, I guess we're going to have to call them ex-theologians. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. No, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, he being a pastor, uh, a church planter through Redeemer City to City, uh, even putting resources out there through the Gospel Coalition and the conferences that they had and and still have. And the legacy of, you know, I think the Gospel Coalition itself is going to be his legacy um, or, or one of his legacies. Um, but, but really, even though he was, you know, he was a pastor and a theologian and a, a public intellectual in a sense, um, I think I really, maybe it's just because where I interacted with him more um, in his writings. But I think his legacy is definitely going to be, and it hints on what you were talking about as well. But his his apologetics, that um, that winsomeness that we have to have in today's culture. I think there is a um, a mindset among maybe some in the older generation about uh, you know engaging in evangelism. You have to. Maybe not necessarily beat people over the head with the Bible, but you have to be forthright and you have to be, you know, stand on the truth and you have to, um, you have to um, almost yell at them until they, or, or speak strongly to them until they are convinced that, you, you know, the gospel is true and all that. Um, but... Keller presents that winsomeness of evangelism and apologetics because mm -hmm. really I don't distinguish between evangelism and apologetics too much. Um, to me, apologetics is evangelism Yeah, because um, everybody who is not a follower of Jesus needs to be shown – that they, you know, obviously it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Lord can use arguments and, um, and even our own lives can be apologetic, uh, to, you know, show compassion and, um, and, and the gospel through the way we live. But, um, but you don't do that by holding up signs that say, you know, God hates I, this yeah. segment of the population, fill that blank in. Um, you do that by sitting down and having a cup of coffee with them. You do exactly. that by building a relationship strong enough to carry that gospel. Absolutely. And, and I am more, not that there's not a place for door to door evangelism or cold evangelism, you know, street corner evangelism. I think there might be some place for that still in our culture, but I think more than anything, our current cultural moment requires that relational. 
um, evangelism. Talking to your neighbor over the fence, inviting Absolutely. the person you really don't like at church for dinner. Absolutely. And I think Tim Keller really exemplified that in his preaching, but also in a lot of his books on apologetics. And um, I think that's how um, how he's going to be remembered. I, I wanted to read this as we close our conversation. Um, and, and it hits on what we've just been talking about. Um, I was trying to think of maybe a Bible verse that obviously Tim Keller is not in the Bible, but a Bible verse that might sum up his life and ministry. Um, and, and this is a Bible verse that, uh, or passage of the Bible that we, we think about when we think of apologetics, because it has, you know, the Greek word apologia in it. Um, and it's also a, a, a verse uh, that I've I've learned from the late R.C. Sproul, who's also a Presbyterian, and so I, mm-hmm. maybe it's a Presbyterian thing. I don't know, but I, I learned this both from Keller and Sproul, and um, it's First Peter three, and verses thirteen to seventeen. Yeah, um, and it says, "Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake." you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. There's that winsomeness having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And I think there's a lot of apologists out there and people who are... um, you know, evangelists, quote unquote, um, that are in your face, that are you know, slapping the Bible over your head and talking about how you're going to go to hell if you don't repent and trust in Christ. And while that is absolutely 100% true. You're never going to convince someone unless they want it to be true. Right. And I think Keller exemplifies this text of being prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you with gentleness and respect. And I think, um, you know, that verse 13 where it says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Uh, I think there's a lot of people that may be overzealous for what is good. And I know Keller was definitely zealous for what was good, but he was zealous in a tempered way. Um, that in a humble way, in a very humble way, uh, in a very self forgetful way, um, that is a testimony to all of us that want to um, be um, evangelists and, and apologists in our own communities, in our own lives, uh, to help our neighbors and family and friends come to know the Lord. And, um, so, yeah, there's a lot we can learn from Tim Keller on that. So, Chris, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Glad that you were here for our very first episode of the Reading for the Glory podcast. I had a great time with you today. Even though you will not be on every episode, your fingerprints will be all over it. You'll be in the background. So our listeners, when you hear future episodes, uh, so we're thankful for him and the work he does, uh, not only at his church, but also here for Reading for the Glory uh, for this podcast. Um, and we're, but we're definitely going to have to have you back on for another conversation for a book discussion or something. We're, we'll have to get that on the books. Happy to do it. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank our listeners uh, for joining us uh, in on this conversation today. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to put a link to Colin Hansen's book. And, and we're also going to put a link to uh, some of the books, some of Tim Keller's books, probably on our website, readingforthegory.com. Um, that we discussed today. We're going to put those links in our show notes so you can find those and have access to those. And we look forward to having you again as we think biblically about books. 
Thank you for listening to the Reading for the Glory podcast. If you enjoyed today's content, we would like to invite you to consider becoming one of our ministry partners. Our ministry partners help to support the ongoing ministry of Reading for the Glory, which allows us to produce content such as our book reviews, our study series, and this podcast. For more information, please visit readingfortheglory.com slash partners. And thank you for your support.